بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dearest brothers and sisters Can someone tell me how many Muslim millionaires do we have in Australia? What do you reckon? One? Is that your dad, is it? <laughs> One of the kids is putting up his finger, one. So it's either you or your dad, mashallah. Okay, how many? I think a reasonable figure according to one of the statistics that I saw was about 500 Muslim millionaires. Uh, if you look at the number of Muslims here, about 430,000 according to the census figures that was recently published, that comes to a percentage of less than 0.003%. 0.003%. Now let me ask you another question. How many Jewish millionaires are there in Australia? How many? Point? Are we saying point? No, no, no. Don't even go to the point. One? Two? Come on, anybody? Recent publications in the Jewish Chronicles state approximately 37% of Jews in Australia are millionaires. Subhanallah. 37% of Jews are millionaires. Yes, salam. Amazing. How many millionaires do we have amongst the Muslims in America? Anybody? Approximately 45,000 millionaires. Muslims, millionaires in America. How many in UK? 10,000 according to the study that was done in 2008 Islam Online published a report from the government that said 10,000 Muslim millionaires exist in the UK in 2008 If you look at the population, Muslim population stated according to the percentage that's 0.0045 and in America if you do the statistics and the figures according to 10 million Muslims you come to roughly around the same sort of figure but all of them 0, .00 something let me ask you another question. Of the top 500 richest people in Australia, how many are Muslim? About a few years ago, there was only one person on that list. Who was that person? Crazy John. Does anybody remember Crazy John? Yeah. Crazy John, may Allah have mercy on his soul, he passed away. And he repented before he passed away and became a good man before he passed away. So we ask Allah to forgive him and have mercy on him and there's so many masjids and so many mosques that he actually helped build and these are things which are not known of and we ask Allah to accept this as an excuse for him and forgive him but crazy John was the only person to have made quite a lot of money and he was the only person in the top 500 list in the top 500 list of Australia's richest people not a single Muslim person exists on the other hand when I went to South Africa and I had a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce, the Muslim Chamber of Commerce. And they showed me a report of the richest people, the top 500 richest people in South Africa. How many are Muslim? Any ideas? More than 150 people on the top 500 richest people in South Africa are Muslim. What's going on? Can you see these figures that I'm throwing out at you? What's going on? couple of things are becoming clear number one we are resource rich but we are economically poor what does that mean we are resource rich because we have so much people so much people and we have so much natural resources that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Muslim countries yet we are economically so poor my brothers and sisters in Islam why am I even talking about being a millionaire didn't the Prophet Sallallahu say that and he made a dua to Allah, Oh Allah, raise me with the poor? Didn't he say, Oh Allah, make me die with the poor and raise me up with the poor? Didn't the Prophet Sallallahu lead a life of simple existence and sustenance? Don't you know of the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he spent two months with nothing but the two black things, water and dates? because water looks black in the dark water and dates to feed him so why in the world are we even talking about this 
my friends, I had the same question when I went to my Shaykh Muhammad Mukhtar al-Shanqiti Hafizahullah and I said, Ya Shaykh, in our time today, should I be poor or should I be rich? Because I cannot reconcile this fact. My dad says, be a doctor, be a lawyer so you can be rich. My mom says something similar to be rich. But my religion seems to say something else. How do I reconcile this? So my Shaykh, may Allah have mercy upon him, told me something very beautiful. And I want to share that with you. He said, Ya Tawfiq, the strong Muslim that Allah loves is the Muslim that has the world in his hand and Allah in his heart. Amazing. He said he has a world in his hand. He plays with it as he wishes, does with it what he wants. He helps who he wants. The money is in his hand, not in his heart. What's in the heart is the hereafter. And this is the essence of Zuhud. A man came to Abu Yusuf, the student of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, and said, Ya Imam, why don't you write to us a book on Zuhud? Write to us a book on Zuhud. What does Zuhud mean? Ascetism, leaving the world, shunning the world. This is how we normally describe it. So Abu Yusuf said, I have already written a book on Kharaj for you. What? I have already written a book about Kharaj. What's Kharaj again? What to do with the produce of this earth and how to distribute it according to Islamic fiqh. So people were confused and, and Abu Yusuf simply closed the door and went away. How do you understand the statement of Abu Yusuf? The way we understand it is that zuhud is not what we think zuhud is. Zuhud doesn't mean that you have to be a fakir. Zuhud and being a zahid does not mean that you have to be poor, my friends. It means that in your heart, in your heart, the world is not there. In your heart and in your mind, the concern is not for this world. The concern is for the hereafter. But in your hand, have the wealth of this dunya to do with it what you want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us to be strong believers. And Nawawi rahimahullah said, by ijma of the scholars, a strong believer that has money and wealth is far more beloved to Allah than a weak believer, a weak worshipper of Allah who does not have any wealth and he is a poor man. Why is that, Ya Nawawi rahimahullah? He said that in Al-Majmu. Why did he say that? Because ultimately a person who has wealth and money, he can help himself and help others. He can give izza and honor to Islam and Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ, when he needed camel, when he needed armors, what did he do? He asked Uthman, Uthman gave him 10,000 camels in one go. This is izza and honor. This is wealth and power. My friends, in the 21st century, it is not honorable to be poor. It is not honorable for you to think I am a great Muslim simply because, you know what, alhamdulillah, I have little money, etc. No, I want you to be rich. I demand you be rich. I order you to be rich. Rich not in your heart, with the wealth in your heart, no, but in your hands. In your heart have nothing but Allah. In your heart have an attachment for the hereafter. Do not shun the world, but shun worldliness. Does that make sense? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, numerous verses in the Quran, tells us to have strength. Allah says, وَعِدُّ لَهُمْ مَسْتَطَعْتُ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ And prepare for those who plot and plan against you whatever you can from strength. He also says about secular knowledge. And what is secular knowledge and these all other types of knowledge except that it gives us economic strength, physical strength in this world. He talks about it and he says in the Quran, وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ صَنْعَةَ لَبُوسٍ لَكُمْ لِتُحْسِنَكُمْ مِنْ بَأْسِكُمْ فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ شَاكِرُونَ وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ Who did we teach? We taught Dawood how to mend metal and how to use metal in order to create bows and spears out of metal. Before that they didn't know metallurgy. So Allah taught them metallurgy. And then Allah says, فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ شَاكِرُونَ So are you thankful for this? So my brothers and sisters in Islam, every one of you must be a zahid in your heart. 
desiring nothing but the hereafter in your heart, but in your hands have the wealth of the world in your hands. So you can help this deen and help this religion and help the vision of the final messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You cannot do that if you're dependent on the government. You cannot do that if your worry is how to defeat Centrelink and how to beat Centrelink and cheat the Centrelink in order to make the most money. You cannot do that if your best investment is having more kids so you can get more money from Centrelink. You can do that by Allah if you empower yourself with the right amount of knowledge that will give you more money that you need and so that by Allah you can then use that to help Islam and Muslims. It is for this reason why the Jews are where they are today. Let's learn something good from them. Let's learn something good from them by Allah. The izza and honor belongs in this world to the person who can control it. Let's stop being moved by the qadr of Allah. Let's start being the qadr of Allah on this earth. And this is precisely my request to my brothers and sisters here. My friends, the question is this. Why is it that despite the Muslim world and Muslims being so resource rich, we are so poor? Why is it? I thought long and hard about this question. Why is it that even though we have so much resources, capacity to do so much, yet we are so poor economically and strength wise? And I came up with three reasons. And I don't know whether you'll agree with me or not, but these are my three reasons. Number one, the first reason why I believe Muslims are where they are is because of something called ajz. What is ajz? Incompetency, laziness, sitting back and not doing something, not striking when the iron is hot, but laying still, being soft, being gentle, just sitting back and not striking. Just, you know, going with the flow. Ads wal kasal. Laziness and incompetency is rife in the ummah today. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sought refuge in Allah from this. He said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al ajzi wal kasal. And he said that every single day, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from ajz and kasal. And what's ajz? Inability, incompetency, and kasal. What's kasal? Laziness. In Mercy Mission, I do not tolerate people with this quality. I ask them to leave. In Mercy Mission, we cannot tolerate this. The vision of the final messenger cannot be supported by people who are lazy. The Ummah cannot rise up if we are lazy, my friends. So I urge you all to remember this point and to train your children to not be lazy. Do you know how we are creating lazy people? We are creating lazy people in our homes and our children, we are creating them to be lazy. Do you know how? Because subhanallah, we give them every form of luxury there is in this world. Winter comes and we buy them a new wardrobe, a winter clothes. Summer comes, no, 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 we can't use last year's clothes. Let's buy them a new wardrobe or summer clothes. Winter comes, we buy them a new duna. And we buy them multiple layers of mattresses for more and more comfort. They wake up in the morning, mom's got breakfast ready for them. They go to sleep and mom is caressing their head. Ya salam. And the Prophet wasallam, he trained leaders from a very young age. You know how? Umar radiallahu anhu said, teach your children archery, teach your children horse riding, and teach your children swimming. He said that in authentic narration for Umar. Do you know why? With archery, you become focused on a goal. You've got a straight goal. And so you're very, very clear. You're sharp. You're focused. You don't waver. You know if your hand wavers, you will miss the target. That teaches you focus and sharpness. Swimming. Why swimming? It teaches you to cope under pressure. When a child is not afraid of drowning anymore, when he knows that when he is under pressure, if he struggles more, he will drown. So he knows the best way to cope with stress and pressure is with a calm and peaceful body. And why horse riding? Because when a child can tame a big horse, an animal larger than itself, it develops that character that I can also lead men. I can also control human beings. 
So he develops that leadership in his, in his mind. These things are not simple things. I remember with my son, Yusuf, may Allah preserve him and fix him up and make him into a gentleman. With Yusuf, I used to teach him horse riding at the age of five in Medina when I was. And I taught him swimming at the age of six. But archery, unfortunately, I taught him with, uh, you know, those sticky ones where, unfortunately, no archery yet. <laughs> Khair. The first problem is ajz and kasr, incompetency and laziness. My brothers and sisters, there is no place for incompetency in Islam. No place for incompetency. If you have failed, then try again. If you have failed, then you've just realized how not to do it. If you have failed, then you've increased your chances of success next time. That's all you've done. But Allah, keep on trying and trying until you can do it. When our brothers, may Allah have mercy upon them all, they said, how are we going to do a conference in a, in a hall like this? I just simply told them, what's the worst that can happen? People may not come. Khair. People won't come. What's the worst that could happen? We lost $100,000. All right, we lose $100,000. What's the worst that can happen by Allah? So think about this, my brothers and sisters. Think about this. Do not give in to laziness and incompetency by Allah. And be focused on what you want to achieve. The second reason why people and why Muslims are not making use of the resources that they have and strengthening themselves is something called wahan. What is wahan, Ya Rasulullah? The companions asked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Hubbu dunya wa karahiyat al maut. Love for this world and dislike for death. We love this world too much and we hate death too much. And because of this, my friends, we don't travel the seas. Because of this, we don't embark on opportunities. Because of this, we don't try new things. Because we are afraid. Oh, I won't give up my job and try a business idea because how am I going to feed my family, we say. I won't give up my profession and try that business idea. Why? Because how am I going to feed my family, we say. My friends, don't be afraid. The whole system was created so that you could serve the masters. MBA was created not to build leaders. MBAs were created so that the people who do the MBAs can work for the entrepreneurs. My brothers and sisters in Islam, if you are afraid, you can never achieve anything in this world. If you are afraid, you cannot drive. But by Allah, you have conquered your fear of driving and your fear of accidents and alhamdulillah, you've started driving. The day you were afraid of falling down, you could never ride your bike. But you conquered your fear of riding the bike and you drove the bike. I ask you all to remember that there is Allah. He is the one who nourishes and sustains you all. But Allah, if you truly had tawakkul on Allah, Allah would provide for you. So do not be afraid. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Do not fear anybody, but fear me. Allah says, fear me, if indeed you are believers. So conquer your fears. Nothing to fear except fear itself. You cannot become courageous until you've had fear. Because what is courage except overcoming fear? A person who is brave is someone who has overcome his fear. So it's normal to be afraid. It's normal, my friends, but overcome that fear. And I see this problem as something hindering the Muslims all the time. No, I can't do that. Why? Because I'm afraid something will happen. I can't start that business. Why? Because something will happen. So fear prevents us all from so many things. My brothers and sisters, conquer fear. And this fear applies to everybody. A brother who is now working, now wants to start his own business, applies to a sister who has an entrepreneurial mind, but something is stopping her. Why? She's afraid of losing the $200 she has in her hand. Fear. Now that Centrelink won't support me, now I have to do some work. Fear is a problem, my friends. Overcome fear. Overcome fear. And by Allah, it's easy. The first time you give a lecture, you're very afraid. First time you write a book, you're very afraid. First time you give a course, it's very, very frightening. But I'll tell you what, after that it's easy. 
The first lecture I gave, my hands were shaking. My legs were trembling. People could hear cluttering. What was the cluttering? My teeth, my molar teeth shaking. But this is probably my 100 or 200 or more than that lecture. I'm not afraid. What should I be afraid of? What's the worst that can happen? Conquer your fears. Overcome your fears, my brothers and sisters, and you'll be able to liberate yourself. Robert Kiyosaki, who is the author of the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He says in his book, before you leave your job, read this book. <laughs> it's a nice book. <laughs> before you leave your job, read this book. He says the number one reason why people don't take advantage of great opportunities. Number one reason why they don't take chance of great opportunities is because of fear. They're afraid that they're going to lose their paycheck. They're afraid they're going to lose the regular and constant help. This is what makes Muslim leaders speak in a particular way because they're afraid of losing help from another country. Conquer your fears. Do not be afraid of anyone but Allah Azza wa Jal. This applies both on a government scale, societal scale, organizational scale, and individual scale. The third reason, my friends, first is ads. Number two is fear. Number three, as we said, is wahan, which is love of this world and dislike for death. My friends, the corruption of this world is amazing. The pious predecessors, they said, beware of the magic of this world. They said, beware of the magic of this world, for indeed, the magic of this world is worse than the magic of Harut and Marut. Where the magic of Harut and Marut used to separate between a man and his wife, and Harut and Marut were two angels sent to Babylon to teach people black magic. Black magic, the essential thing is to separate between husband and wife. The magic of this world separates between a man and his Lord. So beware of the magic of this world. It's beautiful houses, it's beautiful dwellings, luxurious living, beware of this magic. For indeed it is a distraction. And my friends, this frequently stops Muslims from struggling and striving more. Because they want to preserve their beautiful life. They don't want any difficulty in their life. And because of this and the love for this luxury, love for this world, they don't struggle. But I'll tell you what, if you read the biographies of the greatest people that have made a tremendous amount of money in this world, every one of them, every one of them had to sacrifice something significant. Richard Branson says, I sold my car, I sold my stereo, because I was such a great salesman, he sold that in order to invest in his business. What was his business? Record selling. How did he sell records? From a broken down, broken down uh, telephone, telephone booth. He used to sell records. That's how he started his business. Every single person, my brothers and sisters, has to have sacrificed something significant. It's the test, you see? It's the test. But, but if you cannot do that, if you can't sacrifice, you will not be able to achieve any greatness. So my brothers and sisters, overcome these three things. Overcome love of this world, overcome fear, and overcome adz, kasal. Strike when the iron is hot, and by Allah, when you do all of this, you will overcome some of the essential things that stop us from benefiting and becoming self-sufficient. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be our own leaders. Allah does not want us to work for others where we make money for others, but rather specifically in the Quran there is a verse about which most of the Mufassireen have concluded from that verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be our own bosses. What is that verse? Does anyone know? Allah will not give the disbelievers an upper hand over the believers. I want this community to be an entrepreneurial community. To be an entrepreneurial community that does loads of different activities, loads of different businesses. Australia currently is in a good economic state. It is in a good position 
And by Allah, it is possible still to make a lot of money here in Australia. Again, not so that the money can go here, but so that the money can be in your hands. With it, you do as you wish. With it, you help Islam and your family and strengthen yourself and strengthen the image of Islam. My brothers and sisters, I have a bit of advice for the leaders of the Muslim organizations and Muslims in Australia. I have some advice for them because I believe this whole topic of self-sufficiency goes back to them primarily. The first thing I would like to focus on and ask all Muslim leaders in Australia, whether they be groups such as youth organizations or those dealing with other political matters, I advise them all to stop fighting. Enough. Enough of bickering, enough of infighting, enough of saying my center is great and his is not. Support me and not him, enough is enough. And we all know what we're talking about. We all know the politics in the, in the organizations. Enough is enough. Support each other. We need 10 organizations. We need 50 centers. We need 50 masjids. We need so many youth centers, not just one or two, one in Broad Meadows and one in Meadow Heights, one here and one there. We need centers everywhere. I support them all. And I want you all to support all of them. If you have $2, give $1 to this one and $1 to that one. My brothers and sisters in Islam, my advice to the Muslim leaders here is number one. Please stop bickering and infighting. Stop fear-mongering and dividing people into groups. Australian Muslims are already so low in number. Then when they're further subdivided and the religious people are further subdivided, it, it weakens us and it weakens our resolve and weakens our self-sufficiency. But Allah, you cannot achieve any sort of self-sufficiency with this sort of behavior. Number two, my second advice to the Muslim leaders here, have a vision that is far greater than your own organization. When I ask Muslim leaders, what is your vision? Their vision is, I want to have 10 centers. Their vision is, I want to have a large youth center. What is your vision? I want to have 10 masjids. Very internal facing. Rather, I want you to have a different vision. I want you to have an externally facing vision. An example of that is that the New York Police Department, I, I just hypothetically, I just pulled that out of the blue, New York Police Department, their success is not measured by the number of police officers that they have. Their success is measured by the amount of crime that they have stopped. So make your vision externally facing, not internally facing. And by Allah, you will notice something very different. You will notice that it doesn't matter whether you have a big center or not. You will notice that your team will not care whether you have a big place or a small place. You will notice that they care about the value that you bring to people. The number of people's lives you're touching and how well you're touching them. So have a vast vision that is not internally facing but externally facing. And also my brothers and sisters, my advice to the Muslim leaders is not to have a plan for economic sustainability of your own centers only but of the Muslims in general. How are we going to make the Muslims in Australia wealthier, more self-sustaining, more aware of their own affairs, more in tune with their own details and own affairs? This is what we need. Number three, my advice to the Muslim leaders here in Australia is to start using the Muslim resources that are here in Australia properly benefiting the Muslims. An example of that is the halal certification that happens in Australia. Are you guys aware of the halal certification? How much money it makes in Australia? It makes over 10 million Australian dollars per year. Do you know how that is? 10 cents only or 38 cents according to another report. 38 cents for every sheep that is slaughtered that goes to Saudi Arabia or goes to Malaysia and there's millions of sheep that are slaughtered. 38 cents. Whose money is that? Your money. That 10 million Australian dollars is enough to launch two to three schools every single year. 
Two to three schools. We should have no problem in the last 10 years, we should have 30 schools. But subhanAllah, that is not the case. Where is the money? Show us accountability. So these organizations that are controlling the Muslim wealth, that belongs to the people, that does not belong to them, I ask them all to be ethical and to show us that wealth and benefit the community before Allah shows it to us on the Day of Judgment and makes a case against you on the Day of Judgment. So show us that money and start benefiting people. And the last advice that I have for my Muslim leaders here in Australia is to focus on holistic education for the people. Yes, alhamdulillah, lots of organizations exist. Classes and courses are happening. Islamic lectures are happening. Tafsir classes are happening. Fiqh classes are happening. Quran, tahfidh is happening. But now we also need those skills and those important stuff that is essential for people to become self-sufficient. Like what? Like leadership training. Like entrepreneurial skills. Like management skills. These are certain skills that the people, if they were empowered with, they would become better at work. They would become more capable of having their own enterprise. They would become more capable of having their own business. And all of this is something which I advise my Muslim leaders, may Allah have mercy upon all of them, to do. For my brothers and sisters, amongst you all, a couple of practical points of advice, so that you can become self-sufficient. Number one, I want every single one of you to develop a clear goal for yourself in three things. A clear vision for yourself in three matters. Number one, how will I meet Allah and what state do I want to meet Allah? So one clear vision about your spiritual relationship with Allah Azawajal, you as a Muslim. Number two, I want you to have a clear goal regarding how you want to be and how your relationship will be with your family on the day that you die. So your ultimate vision regarding your relationship with your family. So your relationship goal. And number three, I want you to all have an economic goal. What's an economic goal? How wealthy do I need to be? You know, I decided a long time ago how wealthy I needed to be. Shall I tell you how I did it? I said I needed uh, $5,000 a week. That means I need five times 52 weeks. That's 250000 Australian dollars. Uh, that means uh, that's after tax, right, Shahid? So before tax, I need an income of approximately 350000 right? Because I'll... I'll arrange my tax properly, all 400,000, I need an income. So I need to pursue a option by which I can make $400,000 per year. I could be a doctor, I could be a radiologist, for example, a specialist that makes $400,000 a year. That's one option. I could start a manu shop or a pizza shop or something and try and make $4 million worth of sale with net profit of only 10%, giving me 400,000 of which I pay 150,000 tax and I get 250 back. Do you see what I'm trying to say? If I need 400,000 income, then you decide what do I need to do in order to get me 400,000 income? Do I need to be a doctor from which I can get that income? Do I need a particular business by which? But this is how you can practically decide and work towards your goal. Doesn't mean it has to happen tomorrow. For me, it has yet to happen. I'm not making $5,000 a week, trust me. Okay? I'm not as yet, but that doesn't mean I won't get there because I have my own goals and I have my own strategies of reaching that. Most of the reason why people are not satisfied in their heart is that they don't know how much money they need to feel content. They don't know how much money they need to feel rich. Have a figure and then work towards it just like I have taught you over here. Number two, the second advice I have for you is to prioritize your priorities. Put the most important things first. It's very important. Cut out those things in your life that are wasting time. How can you do that? You can do that with the 80-20 principle. Have you heard of the 80-20 principle? 20% 20 of the things are giving you 80% productivity and 80% of the things you're doing are giving you only 20% productivity. Well, find those 80% of the things that are only giving you 20% productivity and cut them out. And only focus on those 20% that are giving you 80% productivity. Okay, how can you do that? Well, you can write it down. Write down all the things that you're doing in your life 
and figure out whether they are worthwhile or not and cut down those things that are wasting your time. Advice number three, I urge every single one of you, my brothers and sisters, to learn those skills that will help you become more self-sufficient. Do you know, when I graduated from Medina University, I was never taught how to be a leader. I was never taught how to manage a company. I was never taught how to run finances, how to understand budgeting. I was never taught that I learned it myself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught me how. I went to Amazon and I asked for every book that I could find on it. I went to Amazon Kindle, I downloaded every book on it. If you see on my iPad, I've got at least 700 books on it. On every single topic that I need to read on. And I read on it as much as possible. At least three to four books every single month. Does that make sense everybody? Empower yourself with the skills. Attend courses, attend lectures that will give you the essential skills. What are those essential skills? Leadership skills, time management skills, understand basic financial skills, so you know what it means to budget, so you know how to save, so you know what's the difference between an asset and what's the difference between a liability. People think a car is an asset, a car is a liability. Essentially, you don't understand the difference, then you'll never, never make money. So these basic skills you need to understand. Number four, please focus on making money through something you're passionate about. Do not focus on making money through something someone else is passionate about. So if I were to ask you, brother, I want to get rich and I want to make some money, what shall I do? Every single Muslim thinks of a pizza shop. Every single, if not, then a kebab shop. If not, then a manush shop. Okay, manush, most people won't know what manush is. Manush is a Lebanese pizza that we eat in the morning. It's very nice, it's nice, very thin pizzas. Have anyone had it? Yes, I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's, it's true, isn't it? If it's not food, we've got no idea what to do. But I'm telling you what, you can make money from what you're passionate about. Sheikh Jafar Idris, may Allah have mercy upon him, told me one day when I graduated from my degree in Medina, he said, Ya Tawfiq, do what you love, money will follow. He said, do what you love, money will follow. It doesn't matter what it is. Subhanallah, people these days have made money from video games. Games, video games. We thought it's a game, it's a worthless thing. But no, if they put their passion into something, they made money from it. People have made money from things you cannot imagine. Do what you love, money will follow. One of my shaykhs, may Allah have mercy upon him, came to me in Medina. And he said, Ya Tawfiq, and he told the class, of course. He said, oh class, tell me how you can make money. So we all gave weird ideas, right, of making money. Most of the food related. <laughs> so he said, this, are, this is how you can make money. Number one, by drugs. Big money, yeah. You can, you can deal in drugs, but you'll probably die, so you won't get time to spend money. So, drugs. Number two is those dirty things like music and girls and all of that, you can make money, right? The third thing he said, which is amazing, amazing, and he had a big smile on his face when he said it, he said, Dawah. You can make a lot of money from Dawah. What? How can you make money from Dawah? And he then went on and he told me about all those evangelist, evangelist speakers that are making millions and millions. So my brothers and sisters, when you have money and you do what you're passionate about, then spread it with the world. Don't keep it in your heart. Don't let it enter in there. Keep it in your hands and give it out. The Prophet ﷺ would not have wealth in the morning except that he would give it away. But he had money that people would give him, but he would give it away. In the last Hajj, he slaughtered a hundred camels. That's a hundred camels. It's a lot of money. But he was given that as a gift. So he, then he gave it away in the cause of Allah and he slaughtered in the cause of Allah. He used to tell Bilal, Ya Bilal, Anfiq wa la takhsha min dhil arshi iqlala. Oh Bilal, give and don't fear that the one who possesses the throne will ever withhold from you. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, become wealthy all of you. Become wealthy all of you, but don't let it enter the heart. Help Islam, help the believers, help the deen, Help spread this message. But Allah, let nothing be in your heart except Allah. But be as strong and as wealthy as you can be. So you do not feel this lack of izzah and honor. And that you bring back izzah and honor in, to you in this world and the hereafter. Zakumullah khair. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.